Welcome to episode 29 of the Horsemanship Breakthroughs podcast, Dressage Naturally, Happy Horses and Personal Development with Karen Rolfe. I'm so excited to share this episode with you today because if you know me, you know that I absolutely adore Karen Rolfe. She's been such a huge influence on my own horsemanship journey. And when I very first started this podcast, her name was at the top of the list in terms of people that I wanted to interview and connect with. So it was an absolute dream come true for me to interview Karen Rolfe. If you don't know Karen, she is the author and creator of Dressage Naturally. She's an internationally recognized clinician who is changing the equestrian educational paradigm. She teaches students of all disciplines and levels from around the world in her clinics and the Dressage Naturally virtual programs. Karen is well known for training horses with a priority on partnership, a student empowering approach to teaching and a positive and balanced point of view. She believes in getting to the heart of our mental, emotional, and physical partnership with our horses by bringing together the best of the worlds of dressage and partnership-based training. In this episode, we discuss Karen's horsemanship and dressage journey and how she combines the two to form dressage naturally, Karen's happiest horse memories, the importance of personal development and self-awareness in horse training, happy horses and giving your horse choice and freedom in training, Troubleshooting when your horse doesn't offer something willingly. Who inspires Karen? Flex boots for horses with sensitive soles. Her surprising answer to what horse people would you have dinner with? Horse personality types and how this affects training. Using positive reinforcement in a sophisticated way. The importance of immersing in a system. Balancing being a student and a teacher plus so much more. Welcome to the Horsemanship Breakthroughs podcast, a source for riding and training insights with the goal of helping your horse be a light, happy and willing partner. I'm your host, Amalia Dempsey, a mainstream equestrian rider who discovered natural horsemanship and equine learning theory. And now I help riders like you achieve connection and communication with your horse so you can have more fun and fulfillment whilst prioritizing the partnership. Get more learning resources, including my free connection and communication mini course at AmaliaDempsey.com. Click the follow button so you don't miss an episode. And if you're enjoying the podcast, please leave me a rating and review or screenshot this episode and share on social media. I hope you enjoy the show. Welcome, Karen Rolfe, to the Horsemanship Breakthroughs podcast. It's an absolute honor to have you here on the show today. Well, thank you for having me. I love talking about horses. (laughs) Me too. I think this is going to be a great episode. And right from the very start of me creating this podcast, I wrote down a list of names of people that I really wanted to interview. And you were top of the list, having had a huge influence on me in my (laughs) horse life. So thank you again and welcome to the show. Oh, no problem. Glad to be here. Cool. So let's jump into the first question. I already know quite a lot about you having consumed a lot of your content, but for our listeners who might not know your story, can you tell us about your horsemanship journey to date? What got you into horses and what has led to where you are today? That's a big question. Yes, it is. (laughs) You can give us the short version if you like. (laughs) Yeah, no, that's okay. I mean, how I got into horses, I don't remember because it was just sort of always a given the joke in the family was, I said, I want a horse. And then I said, mommy and daddy, you know, it just, I can't remember ever not wanting a horse. Uh, My mom had a horse when she was a kid. So it was, and, and there was a little while when I was like in first grade that she actually had a horse. Um, She took up fox hunting. So I got to be around horses and then it just was relentless begging, Uh, you know, horse camp, summer camp. So I ended up getting a horse, just a little funny little horse out of the local newspaper and, uh, did pony club with him. So I, I went up the ranks in pony club. Um, at some point I sort of outgrew that horse and got a different horse and still stayed in pony club. And it was that horse that, uh, took off with me during a junior hunt that our pony club went to. And I broke all the rules. I went, I passed all the people in the red coats and I rode right through the middle of the pounds, Uh (laughs) which is really a no, no. And uh, the huntsman had to gallop up next to me and grab my horse because I was ragdolling. And he brought me up to my mom and said, take this kid for dressage lessons so she can learn how to control her horse. (laughs) So I did. And that actually the dressage barn that I went to was owned by Ann Gribbins, who is, you know, top international judge and trainer and 
a competitor. Uh, so that just happened to be the only place nearby that did dressage. And uh, so with that second horse that I owned, we just went up the levels and competed and did really well and represented the U.S. on the Young Riders team a bunch of times. And um, so he really, you know, I didn't mean to be a dressage rider. I was actually still eventing. And then when he was pre-St. George and preliminary, Anne was like, you have to decide because you're not going to jump an FEI horse over any more ditches. <laughs> like you just have to decide. Uh, so I did because I was a kind of a chicken with the jumping. Yeah, my last eventing course, I cross country course, I approached every jump going, if you want to jump, I'll stay on you. But if you don't, that's okay. And I thought, I'm going to die. Yeah. <laughs> It's not the way to do it. Um, yeah. So then I ended up, um, you know, because of my success, people asked me to train their horses. And so I did. And then um, Ann Gribbins actually ended up having a really challenging horse in her barn that all of her trainers had uh, fallen off of and injured themselves in some way. So she called me and she's like, you want to try? And, um, and cause I had a little bit of reputation for getting along with the special cases just even back then. And I did have success with that horse. Uh, and then, so I, then I became a trainer at her facility and just kind of kept going. And then eventually was willed a horse who was a Grand Prix horse kind of used up. And that's the horse that I first did natural horsemanship with and, then started down that road and one thing led to another and a perfect storm of going to Florida for the winter season, which happened to be seven miles down the road from the Pirellis, which I didn't even know at the time and being really burned out where I was. And the Pirelli said, Hey, you want to come follow us back to Colorado? I was like, sure. <laughs> and so that then, you know, after doing that for kind of two years, I just got my own place. And I said, uh Oh, I don't like how, how am I going to reconcile these two crazy different worlds? Cause this was back in 2003 and nobody used the word dressage and natural horsemanship together. So I sat myself down and I said, all right, I got to figure out how am I making my decisions in every moment? Like, when am I choosing to do freestyle? When, why am I doing Liberty today? How is that going to help my dressage? And that's what caused me to write my book. I, I wrote my book for myself. <laughs> like I need to figure out my system because I'm a professional and I make my living teaching. And now I don't have a system to follow because I'm in new territory and the rest is history. Yeah, <laughs> and wow. then, and then you asked me to be on your podcast. <laughs> so here we are. Fast forward to today. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I can imagine there would have been quite a few conflicts when you were going through working out, how do I fit natural horsemanship and dressage together? Because I think it's a common pattern that people find natural horsemanship, you know, whatever method it might be. And then they go, well, the dressage stuff is wrong. I don't want to do that anymore at all. So that's really cool that you managed to marry those two worlds. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just, I love dressage. I mean, there's yeah. just, it's an amazing feeling when, when done well. And then, you know, how do you not fall in love with doing Liberty and bridalist yeah. riding? I, mean, I felt like a little kid. I'm like, I'm allowed to do this stuff. Like, you yeah. know, so it just felt like it was returning me to my little kid in love with horses roots. And, you know, and the thing is it worked. So I was, I did not go into natural horsemanship with a problem horse and to make a big breakthrough. The horse I did it with, I thought he was fine. You know, I, I was just doing it for silly tricks. And then he made some huge changes in his personality and what he offered. And I went, oh, wait a minute. So it just was a, a matter of looking at what's working. And then, yeah, but then try it was, it's really the decision making. Like, mm -hmm. here's a bunch of tools. Now, what am I trying to create? And how can I use these tools to, to all help create that picture that I wanted with a horse? Yes. And with natural horsemanship, you have a greater toolbox. So why wouldn't you exactly. use those extra things? You mm -hmm. also mentioned that um, before you even got into Pirelli, you had a knack for helping those more difficult horses. Why do you think that was? Um, I think just because I've always kind of been into the relationship with the horse, like the reason I do horses is because I just love them and I want to hang out with them. It wasn't as a, you know, Hey, here's a cool athletic endeavor. I wonder if I can stay on this thing. You know, it, it was, it was really about the connection and the relationship right from 
the get-go. I mean, I used, when I was a kid, I just used to go down there and just, you know, hang with them. So I think just that context is enough because I'm, I'm like, Hey, who are you? And why are you doing that? Instead of, Hey, you stinker. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I spent a lot of money on you and this class is important, you know? So I just was always coming in with that. And I'm a bit non-confrontational just by nature. So highly dominant methods didn't like, I, I, I wouldn't, I couldn't do it. I wasn't very effective at it. And, you know, the, I'm a little bit of a, uh, you know, that same fear, like on the cross country course, like, I don't want to battle with a horse, you know? So I would always find a workaround to avoid the conflict, you know? So that's, it's, it's something I've worked on in myself to like, not be afraid of conflict, but it, it did serve me because like that one horse that had hurt a lot of, well, a lot of people had been injured by falling off of him. Um, he was very odd horse, uh, very odd behaviors. Like he would just stop, go over to the side of the indoor arena, stick his head in the corner and go touch me. And I'm throwing you into the wall. And he would do stuff like that. So, you know, I had looked at the list of other trainers that had flung off of them and I go, well, they're all pretty fiery confident trainer. So my, my response was, I'm just going to sit there and I am going to give him zero to resist. And so we would sit, I remember once he walked me into an apple tree and I'm like in the apple tree. So like if he had reared or done anything, it was dangerous. And I just sat there and people would pass me like, you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm okay. I'm just, I'm just going to wait this out. And pretty soon the horse is like, what was I, what was I complaining about? And, you know, so he just because of my fear of conflict, I'm like, nice horsey, I'm not going to touch you. But it it gave a different approach and it dissolved the resistance. And then he, you know, didn't have a reason to resist anymore. So it, I was already kind of exploring a more mental avenue in rather than just a controlling method, because it was just my nature. And, uh, and then the natural horsemanship just sort of gave me like, oh, this is a thing. <laughs> like I'm doing a technique here. I just didn't have names for the techniques. And I think that's why it resonated with me so quickly because it spoke more to who I, who I was as a person. Yes. And speaking of methods and techniques, listeners can read your book, Dressage Naturally, but could you summarize for us what your training approach and philosophy is with horses? Yeah. I mean, I think right now, what I really focus on is empowering mostly the heart centered horsemen. So that's who I tend to attract to love the process of creating stronger partnerships and healthy movement. That's the smallest nutshell I could give you. (laughs) You So it's really, and I think every word of that counts. So it's about empowering and helping people trust their instincts and be more confident. And yeah, if we can't love the process, what are we doing? It's, you know, with horses, you have to love the process. It's not just about end goals. And then, you know, by combining dressage and natural horsemanship, I'm creating stronger partnerships and healthy movement, hopefully at the same time. Yes. That the best of both worlds. Exactly. And I have seen you have so many amazing moments with your horses, but I'd really like to know from you, what has been your happiest horse memory? Yeah, it's hard because there's, I mean, I'm happy to report there's lots of them. Um, you know, there's, I went first to, you know, sort of the, the winning things with my horse, Brave Tom. I mean, I'm definitely really proud of those and of the accomplishment, but when I really think about the moments that stand out the most, they're kind of really quiet personal moments with the horses that maybe nobody was even around, but, um, you know, if I had to pick, I think there's just some been some moments with my horse, Monty, the lip is on, you know, that was the first horse that I, well, no, I did it with Bubba too, but Monty was just so interesting. A horse to do bareback and bridleless with him was just felt like the greatest gift because he was this pretty squirrely little thing. And it just felt like he really gave me permission. Um, yeah. And it just, there's some pretty, pretty cool memories of just cantering around with my eyes closed, bareback and bridalist. And like, this is amazing. 
<laughs> and he just he had a he had a really interesting sensation to him. He felt like you were riding something without bones. I mean, he just he was so supple just naturally and and yeah, he just had a really interesting sensation and I think just the gift of his deciding that I was okay that he trusted me. I think it was that feeling of trust that he gave me was pretty, pretty cool. So cool. And it's funny how all of these accolades that we, you know, list on our bio are the things that we think we should be proud of most, but really it's those small moments, those, I call them horsey highs, when you just yeah. pop off and you're like, I'm on a horsey high. That was the best ride ever. Or those exactly. small moments when your horse greets you at sunset or beautiful moments like that, that we can't really list on a bio, but they're the really important moments to us. Exactly. And, and, and the good news is you can do those every day. You don't, you know, you can do them every single day and you don't have to do anything fancy, you know, in order to enjoy it because there's some magic moments that are, you know, that I'll come in and I'll tell people about and like, it's like they're telepathic. They're like, I was just thinking this. And then he walked over and he went, I'm like, how did that happen? And it's that feeling of like, oh my gosh, they are we're, we're communicating in pictures and, you know, it might be just something really simple. Like the horse is way over there. I'm thinking, Hey, I'm going to put him over here in a few minutes. And I look up and there he is, you know, just some of that stuff that, that just feels so magical. Yes. And I love that feeling. And then you sort of need to think, Oh, I've got to be careful what I'm thinking because (laughs) I could communicate in that way. (laughs) They might do it. (laughs) They, yeah, they are always reading us. So, I mean, that's why personal development and self-awareness for me is like, you, that's gotta be such a huge focus all the time because they know us. So we better know ourselves because they're reading everything we're thinking and just, you know, the, the practices that help you calm and quiet your mind and know yourself and be able to see, you know, it's really hard to see yourself from the outside, but we, you know, you need to try because <laughs> they are reading everything. Mm, like what you mentioned on your recent podcast, being calm, confident. You might have to help me out on this one. Clear and interesting. There you go. <laughs> and full of love. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I've written that on my whiteboard now. So that's my new oh, mantra nice. going forward. <laughs> so you've obviously achieved a lot in the horse industry. But I'm curious to know if you could have anyone else's job or career in the world, what would you do? That is such an interesting question. Because then I'm like, well, with my current skill set or do do I get new skill sets? Yeah. I mean, as far, you know, it's I have to say, as far as jobs go, mine is really pretty darn enjoyable. I mean, I really do in life spend most of my time doing exactly what I want to do. I mean, how cool is that? Right. So I'm. I'm very content um, with what I'm doing. So then I thought, all right, well, and well, what I was, my career was going to be, if I, if people didn't keep paying me to do horses was a scientific um, illustrator. So that was, that was like a, you know, if the horses hadn't (laughs) interjected themselves so much, I would have gone on that course and I would have been really happy drawing like animals and body parts. (laughs) Um, but, uh, then I thought, all right, if I can reach out beyond my current skill set, what kind of job would I want? Like then, like, I always thought, uh, I mean, I'd love to be able to sing and dance. I just, I mean, I do sing and I do dance, but no one's going to pay me for it unless it's a comedy routine. (laughs) They pay me to stop. Um, I always thought being an actor would be fun. I think just the I think just the, the, like getting outside your own patterns and being someone else for a little while. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, You know, or like a, one of those acrobats. I mean, like, Oh, what is it like to like spin through the air? That'd be fun. Yeah. That would be pretty (laughs) cool. It sounds like no matter what you choose, it would be something creative. You're a very creative. Yes. Yeah. I'm for sure not a cubicle and spreadsheet person. No. <laughs> no. And I love how you bring your art into dressage naturally as well. It's really cool. Oh, thanks. Yeah. 
You have a whole series on happy horses in terms of you interviewed a few different health profession, uh, health professionals, horse professionals um, <laughs> on what their health is my other profession. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, horse professionals in the industry on what they believe creates a happy horse. But I'd really mm-hmm. like to know from you what your opinion is on that. Yeah, it's definitely something I think a lot about uh, every day. And those interviews were really cool. So people can find those on my blog. But um, um, I think number one to keep happy horses is that they get a lifestyle that is like what a horse, what they've been bred, you know, born, evolved to live. So forage, freedom, and friends. You know, those, those are really nice, handy reference. Make sure they have forage, freedom, and friends. And if they're you know, lacking in one, make it up, make up for it in the other one. Right. Um, and part of the friends part is that they, you know, they're herd animals are very social animals in their way so that they have an experience, they get to develop socially and have social intelligence. And a lot of that, you know, is, you know, playing with other horses and, and that's where they get a clear understanding of boundaries you know, so a lot of times training problems can be resolved by just socializing a horse. I've had my herd of horses make big breakthroughs with some of my training horses, just because so many horses have grown up without any social interaction. They've been isolated from age three when someone sticks some shoes on them, and now they're destined for a life of isolation. Um, so that horse on horse interaction is so valuable. And then Once we set them up with some forage and some freedom and some friends, I think within any training system, it's really important that they have freedom and choice. And I know I said freedom twice now. So um, there's freedom as far as like turnout, but there's also freedom within a training system. How much, you know, do they get a chance to be cooperative, not just controlled? And, you know, that my horses, uh, you know, if I hold the bridle up and they're like, turn away where I know, usually they go put it on and I'll be like, oh, it's a bit list day or, oh, let's play online today. Like uh, they have some choices and, you know, even just the, there's a horse that I, I got recently who was going to be put down for behavior issues. And I, I have them now. And he lived in a stall. His life was from the stall to the arena, stall, arena, stall, arena, and maybe every now and then in a turnout, I'll put that in air quotes, that was 40 feet by 40 feet. So not really a turnout. And when I got them, I, I, at first they don't feel good being turned out. That actually causes them anxiety. So I have a, a stall and then a stall. I could open the back door. It goes to a small back paddock. And then the paddock he was in was actually cut in half and I had opened the gate. And there was one day when he was, you know, a couple of weeks after he got there and he was going in his stall and then he'd go out of his stall, then go back in the stall, then go out of the stall, then he'd go to that end of the paddock, then he'd go back in the stall and then he'd come out and then he'd go to the other side of the paddock, then he'd come back, then he'd go to the other side of the paddock, then he'd come back, then he'd go in the stall. I mean, I mean, it's like literally like he'd take three breaths and go somewhere else. And I just sat there watching him like, look, he's exploring. I could go here or I could go there. And I'm thinking he did not have that. The only choice he had was which corner of his 12 by 12 stall is he going to stand in? Everything else was tacked up and ridden in dressage. Oh, can you imagine? So now he's turned out, he's with a herd, he's got, you know, 10, 15 acres to be on and we switch which pasture he's in so he doesn't get bored. Um, So I, I have seen that they just light up in a different way. They need to have a chance to make a decision on their own. And I think I've, I think that makes them happier. And that's something that um, across all the people I interviewed, some version of that came up that they have to um, be given a chance to willingly offer. So that, that to me is my definition of a successful training program is the horse understands what's being asked And he willingly offers when given the chance and the given the chance is the critical part. Yeah. So that's very different than, you know, the horse did what I said because I made him and he complied. 
<laughs> mm, yeah. You know? Yeah. I think some of our listeners will totally agree with you on that, hopefully most of them, but some of them might be thinking, how do I implement that? As in, you know, how do I know when my horse says no, whether it's something I should not do or whether I actually need to train that? How do you just Is it getting that? away with something? Yeah. So this is, it's a great question. And in any moment, you're going to be asking yourself that question. So I think it's understanding what your horse looks like when they understand something knowing what your horse looks like when they're afraid, when they're hurt, when they're confused, or when they're just saying, I don't want to do it. Cause sometimes they don't want to do it for a number of reasons. Some of which could be like, I'm just going to be a little cheeky and see if I can get away with this. And sometimes it's because they have a reason. Um, so I do lots of what I call my silly horse tricks that are very simple things like put your foot there touch your nose to this thing, like really simple, undeniable. Everybody knows when we got it right and they're physically non-demanding. And so I might have a horse um, that's, you know, I go to put the bridle on, they walk away. Is he being disobedient? Well, I might ask him for a few little tricks and then might go, I'll do this. I'll do this. I'll do this. I'll do this. I don't want to do that. And I know they understand it because mm. the other day I held it up and they went, sure, I'll put it on. Mm. So that's where as a trainer, I'm looking for how do I prove to myself my horse is being willing. And if they're being willing in general, but they say no to this one thing, then I have to go, well, why are they hurting? Are they, you know, afraid? Are they, is there a reason, you know, and there's been so many times where something like that has happened. And then later I look closer and I'm like, oh man, I didn't notice there was this little sore or that, you know, that there's reasons. And at the end of the day, like I'd rather err on the side of like, okay, well today we'll do something at Liberty. And maybe I didn't need to do that then, then to do it and then go, oh man, I feel guilty because <laughs> I missed it. And there's plenty of times where that might happen. And I go, I hear you. I'm looking around. I think you're okay let's do this. And I, but I do it with that attitude of like, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to do this for me. You know, maybe it's like, cause it's a clinic and I know maybe, you know, maybe you're not super comfortable, but you know what? <laughs> the guy's not going to be here tomorrow. So I'm going to do the lesson. I hear you. And then I make it up to them so big time afterwards, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So I I'm always kind of balancing and I'm, I'm listening, but I, I think that knowing does, does your horse indeed understand what you're asking? Are you past the teaching phase? And cause sometimes they don't do it cause they're confused. But if you know, like, no, I know that they know this, then you got to go, wow, that's interesting. I wonder why. Yeah. And there could be a long list of reasons why maybe not, but it, we have to, you know, I think if we want cooperation, it means the horse has to, be, you know, tell us when they're not feeling cooperative and it's up to us to create the cooperative willingness. They didn't ask for any of this. So I always go on the assumption that they don't owe us one thing, not one, not one thing, anything. It's totally up to me. If they don't feel like doing it, then that's my fault. I got to figure out how to get the horse to want to cooperate with this. And that's our job as horse trainers and riders. I, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Now you have inspired so many horse people all over the world, but I'd really like to know from you, if you could have dinner with any three horse people dead or alive, who would it be? That's a, that's a hard question. Um, I mean, it's so funny because then you also are going to ask me like favorite horse books and podcasts and I, I'll answer that one probably, you know, I, any of the people that of those, I'd like to have dinner with them. But my first answer was like, whoever knows the yummiest restaurant and can also talk about things other than horses. Ah, interesting. So, which is, I thought was an interesting, interesting thing to pop in my mind. But a lot of times when I do clinics and we do like a group dinner, we'd all sit down and I'd be like, okay, no horse talk. And everyone would be like, now what do we do? Yeah. What do we talk about? <laughs> right. And be like, but then you know, we'd bring up a subject or we, you know, I'd just throw out a weird subject, like anyone here ever experienced something paranormal, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And then, but it's fun because then, uh, you know, there'd be people who had been to clinics and known each other for years 
but never talked about anything other than horses. Mm. And now they, you know, got to another layer. So um, one of my favorite horse people that I would, I would love to go have dinner with is um, the Italian Grand Prix jumper, Luca Manetta. Yeah. I don't know if you know of him, but we actually did our first Pirelli clinics together. We were in the same one. And so he's gone on to um, bring this kind of horsemanship into the jumper world. And um, I like to visit him whenever I can. And whenever we get together, we talk about horses, but we talk about life and we talk about the mysteries of the universe. And it's just, um, yeah. So it's got such a cool energy as well. I could listen to him talk all day. <laughs> oh, I know. Yeah. Yeah. He's just a wonderful human and a lifelong learner. And he's just really amazing with horses. So um, yeah, so <laughs> that's my answer for that one. So just one, only one person and other oh, people that are interested. interested I mean, in. there's, yeah. I mean, you know, when you, um, when I think about other people that have influenced me or books that I have, I mean, mm. you know, Nuno Oliveira, his reflections on equestrian art is just one of those books. You just need to keep laying around on, you know, out. So you can just pick it up open to a page and just read something nice. I love that. It's a easy book to just pick up and read a little bit. And there's always something that kind of oh, gets me back on track. Um, I think he would be interesting for sure. Um, there's another um, person that I love her books is, uh, and she has an online course also, and it's um, actually not, um, well, she is a horse person, but she's also another animal person, which is Jennifer Zellig's. So she, she wrote animal training 101 and she's super interesting. I mean, I learned so much from her books and her course because she's a PhD. I mean, she is an animal behaviorist. She's also um, a practicing Buddhist. Oh, wow. So, I didn't know that. Yes. And so she actually has a new book out called um, Mindful Partners. Um, I don't have that book, but I, she did an online version of that training and I, I did that. But just so very interesting person has worked with all kinds of species of animals. Um, so I find her immensely interesting. And, you know, again, she can talk about all kinds of animals and horses and life, <laughs> you know, yeah. so I've only spent, I, I spent a little bit of time with her out with her sea lions just once, but um, have did her online course, which is very in-depth and um, find her just really interesting because she's very scientific and mm -hmm. also very much about the relationship, which I think is very interesting. Um, Philip Carl is interesting. I've been to observed a couple of his clinics and did have, get to have dinner, you know, at the group dinner with that and got to sit next to him. And he's actually quite interesting. Um, also get him on a subject, pretty fiery. Yeah. <laughs> <in> his opinion. <laughs> so <laughs> it's pretty entertaining. Um, yeah. So, you know, I'll go to dinner with most people as long as they're, they're nice. <laughs> yeah. I think it's so interesting that you mentioned you'd like to talk to people about things other than horses, because to me, it looks like you just live and breathe horses, but I suppose like anything, it's good to have outlets and to be able to speak about other things and enjoy other things because, you know, maybe perhaps if horses are just your life, then you might burn out. Yeah. You know, I've always been like that. And I remember, gosh, when I was still back on Long Island, I had some friends. Um, and, you know, I remember one day I was you know, long work day. It was one of those days where like things didn't go well. And I remember I was over at their house and drinking a glass of wine and I'm just like, oh, you know, and this horse is doing this and this, I was kind of complaining a little bit, which is I don't do that so much anymore, but he just sat there looking at me and started giggling. He's like, Oh, poor Karen, her horsies didn't behave today. And I went, yeah, thank you for that perspective. <laughs> yeah. We got to keep it in perspective. So I've always had, um, you know, friends who weren't necessarily into horses. Um, uh, my husband's not a horse person. Uh, he's into photography and music and you know, now helps me run the business, but yeah, I, I really like to, um, keep the conversation, you know, for my own mental health and life balance. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think that's wise advice. And I have a, I call him the non-horsey husband because the comments he makes are just hilarious sometimes, but often a lot of common sense as well, because I feel like when they're removed from, you know, all the clutter that we have and all the knowledge that we have around training horses, sometimes it's the most common sense and simple answer that we need. Exactly. Yeah, no, that's, you know, sometimes we miss the forest for the trees and, you know, the, the joke is, you know, that you see this person doing, I'll just say a dressage test, you know, having a bad ride and they're going along and everything's the mouth is in the tongue and people are like analyzing the angle of the shoulder in and, you know, the amount it's tracking up and the husband walks up and goes, well, that doesn't look like any fun. <laughs> you know, they're like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, it just reminds me of a time when I was having some difficulty with one of my mares and I was like, oh, you know, like a, she doesn't really like to move forward. Um, and first of all, he goes, well, how does she move backwards? <laughs> and then um, <laughs> and then he goes, um, well, why don't you just do things that she likes doing? And I was like, good point. She likes moving in a big open paddock. So, <laughs> yeah, 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 no, I think it, I, I find it healthy and refreshing to, yeah, get out of the, <laughs> just keep expanded. <laughs> On another note, what has been your best horse-related purchase in the last 12 months? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, I am really enjoying, uh, I bought some boots for my horse. So I have a couple horses that go better and they get, have a little sensitive soles. All my horses are barefoot. Um, and I got some flex boots. I might have gotten them more than a year ago, but um what I, they, they're holding up. And what I love about them is they're super easy to put on, um, some boots, um, that are good, but you have to like measure precisely. And you gotta like, Oh, I got to rasp their feet again in order for it to fit in. And these just sort of are a little more forgiving. Um, maybe that's why they call them flex boots and they're kind of squishier and I don't know, they, they've been holding up and they're just easy to put on. And that makes my life a lot easier. <laughs> Great. So. And so these are hoof boots that go onto the hoof for horses who um, are sensitive to harder ground or exactly. that, yeah. Yep. yeah, nice. Yep. I'll have to check them out. Yeah. Now, before we sort of touched on your uh, resources that you like, like the Jennifer Zellig's um, courses, mm -hmm. Nuna Oliveira, Philip Carl. Was there anyone else or any other resources that you wanted to mention in answer to that question? Um, yeah, I do. There's one other book that I, I recommend to anybody who takes my courses and it's called, Is Your Horse a Rock Star? And it's a simple little book. Um, I've actually met the, the author of it. She came out here once um, and did a little mini clinic sort of thing. Um, and it, it, it kind of sets up like you, you try to read your horse based on four characteristics. So is your horse, where is he on the scale of dominant to submissive high energy or low energy, um, afraid versus curious and, um, friendly versus aloof. And the hardest part is to Cause you're supposed to assess this, like your horse's nature out in the herd, not your relationship with the horse. So when you have a horse that you have a pretty good relationship with, it's this harder because they're already trained and, you know, there's some development. So you think, all right, if I threw my horse out in a herd, you know, is he the one pushing the other horses around or getting pushed around? Is he the one in there, like playing games with the stick or is he standing over by himself? If you throw something weird into the paddock. Is he running towards or running away? You know, and whenever he takes off galloping, is he sort of trotting behind, <laughs> you know? So you try to do that. And then she made these really cute archetypes for each of these combinations. And, you know, and it's, so it's a little bit like a Myers-Briggs test for your horse, but the, the way she did it is so simple and fun um, but I find it incredibly useful. So some people might go, oh, she's anthropomorphizing in the way she does it, or it's like, oh, this is way too simplified, but it's just simple enough that you can actually utilize it. 
you know, some, sometimes you do the Myers-Briggs test on yourself and it, you, you need three hours just to read through the whole thing. Like she does it in a way that I think she did a super job explaining it. And I found it really, really helpful in making decisions much more than, um, you know, some other methods are like, are they right brain or left brain or introvert extrovert? I, I find horses, they have more tendencies of where they spend in the left brain, right brain, introvert, extrovert. But I, I find those labels are not so helpful because we need to move them through those, you know, like we don't want the left brain or right brain introvert to stay there. We're trying to move them out. So don't call them that because we're not trying to stay there. (laughs) But, But so, you know, one of the archetypes, like if they're like the boss, which is dominant, high energy, afraid and aloof. I've had two of those. They can, that character can have right brain and left brain moments, and they can be more introverted or extroverted at different times. But that baseline kind of character is still there. They still tend to be the one who wants to push horses. They tend to be high energy, tend to be aloof and tend to be afraid. Like, and you can train around that, but it, it doesn't, that nature is still there. So I found it just a super helpful tool and it's really fun. It's a great little bathroom book too, because you'll just chuckle reading it and the cartoons, little images she has are just really special. Yeah, they're very cool. I found it quite helpful as well, thanks to your recommendation. Can you tell us which characters each of your horses are, according to Dessa Hockley? Oh gosh. Yeah. And you know, I have to, I have to dig that out and um, assess my new one. Yeah. Um, Cora. Yeah. I, yeah. Cora. Cause mm, she is. She is a sassy pants. Um, yeah. yeah, Monty and Atomic are both the boss, mm-hmm. which is the picture is like a gangster with a machine gun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not easy. Um, Ovation is a reluctant rock star for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see. Natia can be a little bit of a, uh, I think it's the prize fighter. She can, yeah, she's interesting. Um, Solana is reluctant rock star, um, but different than Ovation. Mm -hmm. They're, they're, they're different, but she, they have the similar quality of like motivation is the whole ball game. Like you got to find the way in. So she agrees (laughs) that she wants to do it. Like, um, even though they're, they're kind of different characters, uh, Ovation's, just much, much, much more, um, friendly. He's just so he's a close talker to you, Seinfeld. (laughs) Um, Oh, who else do I have? Um, what was Jedi? uh, Jedi was, um, the, oh gosh, it's the D E A F. Um, he was the one where like the head was spinning in different directions. I forget what the, um, name of that one was. Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I was only looking at it the other day. I think it's in the front, actually, the list of all of them. D-E-A-F is the wild card. The wild card, yes. But the sweetest wild card. But yeah, he could be like the perfect beginner's horse. And the next thing you know, he's like, ah! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the F was very, very, very strong with him. So that, that, like, you forgave him for everything because he's so darn sweet and friendly and always was like, I'm here. I'm, I'm, I'm flitting around, but I'm here. Yeah. And if our listeners are going, I don't know these horses, you can check them out in the video classroom that Karen has. And you really do get to know each of Karen's horses on a, well, what feels like a personal level, because you can see oh. how Karen works with each of these different types of horses through various scenarios. So I definitely recommend people check that out. <laughs> Now, Karen, can you tell us what is your ultimate goal with horses? Yeah, it's definitely uh, changed recently from, um, yeah, and it's interesting because I, I've been thinking lately, like, I'm, where is this little bit of confusion coming from? Like, because I realize, oh, I'm, I'm not reaching for the same goals that I used to because they're not as much about performance or about what I want to do. 
but it's much more about how I want to do it. Mm. Um, so the, my goals, like, you know, I'm always training for dressage, right? So I'm always trying to just progress my horses as high up as they can go with being able to do dressage movements. But the, it's much more about how I want to do it. So how can I be as light, as clear as I can, and how can I better understand my horse? So definitely maybe it's an age thing. I'm just getting much more into the <laughs> the relationship on a different level. So it used to be, I want to get this relationship and partnership so that I can get them, you know, to upper level. Now yeah. it's like, of, of course, I'm going to be training. I'll progress their training. But the, my main goal is, is how can I be lighter, clearer and have better understanding? Mm -hmm. So, um, which by the way, is going to help progress your training. Yeah. You know, so again, it, it's that loving the process. So just every day, you know, like the other day I did an experiment with Natia, who's pretty low energy. I mean, she's not a prancer. She's just, you know, she, she's not one to offer on her own very much, but if I ask her, she'll do it. And so the other day I was out there, I'm like, well, what happens if I really don't like push at all? Like if I just re let me just check. And she was amazing. I'm like, oh gosh, I'm using these aids that I don't need anymore. So that other layer, so doing, she did the same things that I've been doing with her, but I literally just sat there. And I'm like, I'm just going to I'm just going to think it like, let's just see where I'm at with this. Yeah. Wow. And she's, she just offered more. I'm like, oh man, you'd think I'd have learned this lesson by now, but there's just always these layers. And so that for me is just um, really interesting. Yes. And I think, yeah, just mentioning that enjoying the process really is the yeah. ultimate goal. And it sounds like all along since you came across natural horsemanship, well, even before that, that your goal was really partnership, but it sounds like that's even more the focus these days. And a theme I've noticed in your classroom, probably in the last maybe 12 months is I've seen a lot more positive reinforcement. Can mm -hmm. you tell us about your journey into that? And if that is a theme or maybe I'm imagining things. Yeah, well, it's something I've always done I just wasn't so sophisticated about about it and and then it it's definitely coming up I'm getting more and more students who were doing positive reinforcement who could kind of like talk all that talk and I'm you know I'm just like I don't understand what they're saying <laughs> and you know I remember years ago in New York I had a couple of my dressage students who were actually dog trainers and they trained dogs for like the handicap I mean like mm -hmm. real you know whatever that's called, but just impressive. Like they, the dog could go get the mail, and, you know, and move someone's leg in, you know, in their wheelchair. Um, and they, I remember this one student was asking me all these questions, like, well, are you using operant this? And I'm like, what are you talking about? I put my leg on and the horse goes, <laughs> you know? And so I'm thinking, gosh, I'm really, so many horse people are not really that sophisticated in, and you know, scientific animal training. So you know, when some of my students were using terms I didn't understand, I'm like, I gotta like research this. And that's what really brought me around to Jennifer Zellig's. And like, I need to be able to speak intelligently about this because I'd also run into people who are like only positive reinforcement. And if you didn't do only, so I'm like, okay, I need to have some language to speak to these people because by the way, there's no such thing as only positive reinforcement. Because the, by nature, as soon as you don't give the treat, you're using negative punishment. So anyway, that's a whole other subject. But now I can talk about it. Yeah. So it, it just was like, a, hey, I got my game and like, look at this. So I always did use food rewards, but the sort of, um, you know, using a, a bridge, you know, and marking it and thinking about that, you know, it from a more, you know, real animal behavior scientific method. Um, yeah. So now I think I, I just am a little bit more aware and I'm using different terminology. That's more the correct terminology and investigating that a little bit more because it's such a huge tool. Yeah. It works. I mean, lots of stuff works. And, and in the end, I really think 
with horses, we use primarily, um, I use primarily negative reinforcement and positive reinforcement and as little of things in the punishment department as possible. And it, you know, from what I've read, punishment is one of the least effective tools anyway. Um, but I'm definitely in the idea that you can flow between all the quadrants and, and know what to know what you are, you're using a technique, you might as well understand what it is. And uh, yeah, and I don't think negative reinforcement is bad. It's, it can be a dance, you know, and you could be walking across the street and someone guides you out of the way so you don't get hit by a car. That's negative reinforcement when you're ballroom dancing and someone puts a little pressure and you move like, you know, I have a whole podcast on pressure because I think people can get a little crazy about it. Um, but yeah, I, and that's, I, that's another reason I highly recommend Jennifer's book, animal training 101, because she goes through all of this kind of stuff, the stuff that works with sea lions and dolphins and <laughs> tigers yeah. and, you know, and horses, um, and, and in a way that's, um, very refreshing and gives a very good perspective and like, here's this technique and here's when I would use it and here's what it's good for. Um, so I really credit her for anything that I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure our listeners will check that book out as well as your podcast episode on pressure, which I feel like is a really um, common sense and educational episode on pressure and how we use it in horse training because, yeah, horses are different to other animals and negative reinforcement is something that has traditionally been used for a long time and now we're seeing the rise of positive reinforcement in that space. So definitely mm-hmm. check out that. And I'd like to know what advice would you give a 12 year old aspiring to be like you? Oh, (laughs) Um, love your horses. Just love your horses. Uh, I think create your own dream. You know, think about what, what do you really want to do? What do you, what's your vision? And then to trust your instincts that if what you're doing is leading you to that dream right so sometimes you'll get yourself in situations like this doesn't feel right you know trust that because there's lots of situations you can get in and I think another piece though is to experience immersing in a system Mm -hmm. so choose that system wisely one that feels like it leads you to your dream but it's I think it's really important to to experience that following of a system and seeing you go from this and you go through this stage and then you go through this other stage and then you get to this other end. Um, That, that was something I was able to experience by being with Ann Gribbins for 20 something years. And it was hugely valuable that there is a system, there's progress and it goes through ups and downs, but you come out the other end. And then having said that, the next step is be ready to throw out the system or challenge it, test it. Is that really true? Is that really the best way? I mean, that's, so I'm, this is autobiographical, right? So I was deep in a system and then I could see what did that system do well and what were all the missing pieces. And then that's when I went, even as a Grand Prix trainer with decades of experience, I went and I immersed in another system, the Pirelli, you know, I went to the Pirelli. So I immersed in that so, and then I saw, what does that do really well? What are the missing pieces? And then I, then I stepped back and said, what's my dream and used those systems to create my own. So love your horses, create your dream, trust your instincts, immerse in the system, then throw away the system <laughs> or throw away the stuff that doesn't work and keep the parts that, that do. And then I think just always the advice is um, personal development. Yes. Yeah, I think that's just uh, it, anything in life, personal development, know, know yourself. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think deep down in all of us, there is a 12 year old girl who's secretly wanting some advice from Karen. So <laughs> thank you for that lovely message. Including me. <laughs> I, still, I still feel like that. I mean, it's just ridiculous. I'm still, you know, Dana's like, what are you doing out in the barn all day when it's pouring rain? I'm like, I'm just brushing my horses. Yes. <laughs> I'm love that. <laughs> so good. And, and you're so humble. I, and I think 
it's really interesting because even in your videos, you talk about your learning and you're going through things and you're having challenges. So how do you balance being a teacher and a quite a huge influencer, but also a student? Oh gosh. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the older I get, the more I feel like I don't know anything. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've heard that that's a good sign, but it, you know, I, I think it, you know, it comes to that beginner's mind. I, I what are the the five most dangerous words in the English language? I already know that. Or is that four? Whatever, however many words that is. I already know that. Um, and that's why I highlight in the in as part of my method is the um, importance of experimentation and curiosity. Because the minute you get on a horse and just go, I know what this needs, and you're not really feeling that individual horse on that day with you, I think that's a problem. So Um, yeah, you have to balance the, Hey, I have experience. I probably know, I know some things, but then at the same time, holding the space of, and I wonder what's going on right now. So that's a paradox and all the best things Mm -hmm. in life are wrapped in a paradox. So that's one of those paradoxes is if I, you know, trust your, you know, have confidence in your experience and be open to a new idea. And, exper- and needing to experiment and being curious. And I think that's hard to blend. Um, so, you know, re- I go through waves or phases, I guess, seasons um, where I'm just like, I know what I'm doing and I'm going to teach and I'm going to make content. And then I go through another wave of like, I don't know anything. I need some help here. And that's when I get out the books or I read or I take someone else's course and um, I just got excited. I'm signing up for um, uh, a clinic series with um, Louis Lucio. Um, and I'm like, yay, I get to be a student. I mean, I just, I got, so, I did a clinic in December with him. I'm so excited. Yeah. <laughs> so excited. It's fun being a and student. <laughs> I love being a student. So I go, you know, I choose wisely and I go through phases, you know, of, and right now I'm in a, like, I need to learn more stuff phase. Um, but I think that's a good thing. I think you always need to be open to new ideas and suggestions and, and you can be open and still be confident. You know, I can look at something and go, yeah, let me entertain that idea and then go, nah, not for me, <laughs> you know, yeah. experimentation um, and curiosity. I love that. I think that's something you, you've got to bring forward no matter what area industry you're in I think it's important to stay open-minded now we sort of covered your advice or your message that you'd like a 12 year old aspiring person to um (laughs) to be like you but is there something else what is the one message you would like our listeners to know or hear from today's interview oh my one message is always the one it's at the bottom of every email you'll get from me it's at the bottom of every single page on my website and it's this to never underestimate the possibility for things to improve in ways you cannot yet imagine. That is so yes. beautiful. And I have seen that everywhere. <laughs> and I'd love to know like when you, when you came up with that and, and what triggered that and how that applies to your life. I don't remember where it came from, but it sure stuck. Yeah. I mean, I think it's in my book. So mm-hmm. it happened somewhere before that. So I'm, I'm not, it's, I've been saying that for the long time and yeah, I think it's just the eternal optimist in me, but I think it really came from the self-development piece and, and, you know, that's just, it's part of my deep character that I always feel like things can always improve. I mean, I will fight that in court, you know? (laughs) It always, you know, it's, it, it's funny because sometimes people like make me fill out a survey on a scale from one to 10. I'll never give it a 10, even if it's fantastic. Like, well, why didn't you give it a 10? Because it could be better. That's the dress I'm fastening in you. <laughs> yeah, right. But it's not from a critical point of view. Yeah, it's from a like, well, I, you know, even if something's amazing, I don't want to be like, well, that's it. it that's as yeah. good as it's going to get. I'm like, can you imagine if it got even better? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Absolutely. And I just think there's, there's so much room for, yeah, layers upon layers that we're not even tapping into in this universe. 
So, yeah, (laughs) that's where that comes from. (laughs) Nice. And I think that's a a really good note to wrap up on. Thank you so much for coming onto the podcast today. Before we finish up, can you tell us where our listeners can find out more about you and what you offer? Oh, sure. So dressagenaturally.net is where you can find everything. There's so many resources there that are free. You can look at my blog or get to my podcast, um, find out about the online courses and things like that, that I have. But um, the best place to start, if you're new to me, is just go to dressagenaturally.net and then click to get the three free videos. I chose three videos that kind of are usually people's most common uh, challenges they have um, with their horse when they're starting to move towards dressage uh, and just grab those videos and take a look. It'll give a great introduction to what I do. And then from there, we'll figure out what the next step is. Excellent. I'm sure people will check that out. Thank you so much. It's been an honor having you on the show. I can tick this off my bucket list now and happily say that I've interviewed Karen Roth on the podcast, which is pretty awesome. Uh, Well, thank you. Thank you for the interesting questions. Definitely some, some unique ones there. So that was fun. Thanks for listening to the Horsemanship Breakthroughs podcast. Make sure you hit the follow button so you get notified every time a new episode is released. And if you've learned even just one small thing from today's show, I would really appreciate if you could leave a review on Apple Podcasts or screenshot this episode and share it on social media. You can connect with me on Instagram at Amalia underscore horses or my website, AmaliaDempsey.com, where you can find free resources to help you on your horsemanship journey. That's all for today. Thanks for being here. Remember to train with kindness and ride with excellence and I'll see you in the next episode.